Okay, go ahead and admit all then, Vanessa. Good morning, everyone who's coming in. I'm just starting you with a couple of Zoom tips as a reminder for the entire day of viewing. So this is how um, right now, so my screen is being shared if you wanna make it so that you can see the presenter and what's on the slides, uh, make sure you've got side-by-side -side mode checked. And of course you can toggle back and forth between speaker view or gallery view. And here's where we are. So um, Brenda's gonna do the welcome, but I'm just gonna let you know that you are in the right place. I saw a couple of texts from people who were worried that the workshop was starting next weekend, but our Transnational Solidarities weekend, uh, weekend workshop for teachers is today. So uh, you are in the correct place. And I think I see everyone who was in the waiting room is in, is that right, Vanessa? Okay, great. All right, um, I'm gonna switch over to Brenda, who's gonna do the introduction for our opening remarks. Uh, welcome to the 2020 African Studies Association Annual Teachers Workshop, which is sponsored by the Outreach Council. I'm Brenda Randolph, Outreach Director at Howard University Center for African Studies. Uh, originally, the workshop was planned for here in Washington, and we anticipated that, well, maybe about 40 teachers would attend, but this virtual platform permits us to reach many more educators. We're so excited about that. Uh, raise your virtual hand or your real hand if this is your first outreach workshop. We hope that you will stay connected with us. You register through our Outreach Council website asaoutreach.org. Save that link. It is your path to each of the 10 outreach programs that make up the Outreach Council. A reminder, your registration gives you access to the ASA Scholarly Conference, which begins next Thursday. And this is a wonderful opportunity. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolyn A. Brown, the President-elect of ASA. She is professor of history at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey campus. Dr. Brown specializes in African social, urban and labor history and the history of slavery in Africa. She is the author and editor of several books, including Repercussions of the Atlantic Slave Trade and Africa and World War II. Dr. Brown has taken an active role in teacher education for many years. In 2007, she worked with Yusuf Caruso of Columbia University to organize a very successful outreach workshop at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art attended by 100 teachers. They raised several thousand dollars to give each teacher $100 worth of curricular materials. Also, she arranged for Cabo winners Wage and Penda Jakite to do a reading of their book I Lost My Tooth in Africa, which is set in Mali at a Bronx school that unfortunately had lost several Malian children from a devastating house fire. Dr. Brown fully understands outreach's role as a bridge between scholars and teachers. In 2001, she organized Fighting Back, African Strategies Against the Slave Trade a powerful symposium that brought together a number of top African studies scholars and included a workshop for 10th grade teachers. In 2017, she made sure that educators and the public participated in the Global Timbuktu Symposium, which included international Islamic scholars from Mali and the US. Prior to the symposium, she brought a school teacher from Mali to meet lo local teachers and students and set up a project in which New Jersey spoke to students and teachers in Mali via Skype. 
Dr. Carolyn Brown certainly speaks the language of outreach fluently. And now she will be with us um, through a taped message. Okay. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the African Studies Association, I welcome you to our teachers workshop sponsored by our ASA Outreach Committee. Thank you all for coming. You're in for a very exciting and valuable afternoon. This is the first time we've held a virtual workshop, an annual conference. COVID-19 hit us just as we were planning our annual conference, which was to be in Washington, DC. Initially, we thought we would cancel the conference, but as we became aware of the, the technological resources, especially Zoom, that were available to us, we decided to experiment with the virtual format. In other words, we took lemons and made them into lemonade. In the process, we realized that virtual conferences have some advantages. Number one, they are less expensive to attend. Two, participants can be from all over the world. Three, there are many resources that can be shared virtually. And four, a virtual workshop is an excellent way of promoting networks between educators in many different areas of the world. The Outreach Council has designed an amazing collection of presentations on the humanities and social sciences. These are a bounty of riches that can be incorporated into your curriculum on topics that resonate with the interests and experiences of your students from kindergarten to high school. The topics range from the histories of ancient Nubia and the mysterious Timbuktu Mali. Um, the name, it's actually a name that freed African Americans gave to their 19th century settlements in New Jersey and in New York. The impact of COVID on all aspects of African life and contemporary movements in Africa against climate change, political oppression, and Black Lives Matter, which is an excellent example of how small the world is. A movement against police abuse in the United States stimulated social justice protests on the continent. The most recent and powerful example is the anti-SARS movement in Nigeria against an abusive sector of the Nigerian police. You will also see a film, Black and Black, on the complicated relationship between Africans and African Americans in the US. This is very timely because we now have a significant number, over 2 million African immigrants in the US many of whom may have children who are in your classes. In New Jersey, for example, we found out that K through 12 students in our schools speak 35 African languages. As an African American who is a professor of African history, I am aware of the historic tensions and contradictory relationships, but I can see now major changes associated with the generations of Africans who were raised in the United States. For example, there's Dr. Foluso Bakuyrede, a cardiologist who chose to open a clinic in the Mississippi Delta because slaves once lived there. And he helps to prevent the epidemic of diabetic amputations in that area. There is also Dr. Nafisa Agbubonye from Niger, who is the Director of Public Health in Black Hawk County, Iowa, an epicenter of Tyson's meatpacking company's COVID-infested Waterloo packing plant. African refugees are forced to work there. There is also Neka Ogunwike. She was elected twice to be president of the WNBA Players Association. She pushed to protect her players from having to play during the height of the COVID pandemic. She argued on TV, quote, they shouldn't have to jeopardize their health for others' entertainment, unquote. Now I want to conclude with an invitation to you to attend the annual meeting next week. Usually the workshop occurs at the same time as the annual conference and educators are not able to attend them. But this year, your workshop is the week before our virtual annual meeting, which is November 19th through 21st, next week. You are able to attend virtually. Your registration for this workshop will allow you to attend. There are over 200 panels on a wide range of African subjects 
and a board-sponsored series, Africa and COVID, of 24 panels on the pandemic's impact on the continent's arts, literature, politics, and health. Please check the program at africanstudies.org. Finally, I would like to thank the Outreach Council for preparing such an important series of presentations. The African Studies Association sees the training of educators as a critical part of promoting the awareness of Africa and debunking dangerous, degrading stereotypes about the continent. You are helping to bring international cultural literacy to the American public, a public, in fact, that is increasingly representative of the world. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you so much. There you go. Okay, Brenda, I've sent it to you to the next slide there. Thank you everyone for watching that. I hope the, the sound was okay. Uh, yeah, it is my um, great pleasure now to introduce Ome Congo. Uh, many years ago, uh, I attended a multicultural festival in Southern Maryland. A young man wowed the audience with an electrifying pr presentation. Who is he, I asked my friend. Oh, that's Ome Congo Dabinga, she replied. I never forgot him. When I was helping to organize teacher workshops for ASA, he was the first person I thought about. Later, I asked him to form at the middle school where I was working. He had those squirmy, chatty students on their feet and echoing his powerful words. Ome Congo's life mission is to inspire all across the globe to take a stand when they witness injustice, no matter how small or large. A trilingual poet, TV talk show host, rapper, and professor of cross-cultural communication at American University, Ome Congo is a rare combination, a scholar and consummate performer. He has spoken before the United Nations, partnered with the State Department to conduct youth leadership training overseas and speaks to leadership in youth student conferences across the country. He provides leadership, educational diversity empowerment as a consultant and motivational speaker for organizations, associations and institutions. His most recent book, The Upstander's Guide to an Outstanding Life, is a life balance book for students. And now, Omekongo Dibinga. Thank you very much and good morning and afternoon and, and evening. I, I know it's somewhere, it's evening somewhere, it's morning somewhere, thanks for that. Uh, I, I'm very excited to be here. And I know that our, our time is short. And so I wanna break down what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to introduce a concept to you as it relates to teaching about Africa and the diaspora. And it's, it's just a simple four letter word and, and that word is free. And the free is an, is an acronym. And the free stands for filter, release, educate and emancipate. So for each one of those words, I'm gonna share a poem uh, kind of get our juices flowing a little bit, our creative minds going a little bit. And then I'm going to break down what each of those four mean. And so I'm a fan of acronyms because we can always take them and apply them. So if that's cool with y'all, I'm going to focus on this first poem, which deals with filter. And we'll take some questions in the chat. You can drop those in there and time permitting, we'll get to some of those at the end. So let's go. First poem is entitled Pulse of the Motherland. Y'all good? Y'all good? Everyone's get, getting it in. Sherney, you're good. Luke, you're good. Felicity, we're getting it on. All right, all right, we're seeing it. Let's, let's, let's make it happen here. Let's go. So check it. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, but it has become appallingly clear that you can judge an entire continent by its media coverage. You see, you can color an entire continent dark with the po paint the poorly placed perception when you rely on the media to teach you your Africa lessons. Because I come from a continent that the world thinks is a country. And to put it bluntly, we're all HIV positive until proven negative in the eyes of the media. 
It's like Africa is either one big safari or Kalahari with seething heathens and no sense of religion and home to animals and animism because TV renditions of African afflictions have created a depiction of a land of savages where the world's most dreadful diseases exceeds the law of averages. And since American TV only shows you the ravages of a select few nations, most Americans juxtapose the mother of civilization with phrases like damnation and starvation. And so until we take control of our own images, we can't expect to see a true representation of our beauty. Most non-Africans believe that the most Africa has contributed to the world are phrases like Hakuna Matata and Asante Sana Squash Banana, along with exotic vacations in remote locations, because I've never heard an American TV news station even say that we're made up of 55 nations. In the eyes of the media, we're just underdeveloped wannabe Caucasians still searching for civilization if you buy the media's interpretation of who we are. But am I taking this too far? Because to me, the real problem be the WBA. NBC and NBC, which are the real WMD, weapons of mind destruction, because most people, including many Africans, only see what they see through the smart bombs they call TV. And it's not just a newscast. It starts at like age three, because I grew up watching images of Bugs Bunny dressed in grass skirts and blackface, speaking in African dialects. And every 10 years, there's a new version of Tarzan on the TV set. And I don't know about y'all, but I recall seeing gorillas pass for Africans in those 10 in cartoons. And if you remove Marvin Marsh's helmet from Looney Tunes, he's probably an illegal African alien or famine-stricken African child of his belly protruding. And it's these convoluted images that have helped create grown-up policymakers who partially base their opinions of our homeland from films such as Congo, Gorillas in the Mist, and the air up there. And we can't forget Tears of the Sun, which left too many tears on the sons and daughters of Africa searching for a positive portrayal of who we are. But that won't happen until we as Africans take responsibility for our portrayal because the betrayal of our friends from CBS, Fox, and CNN means that we will never see an end to these characterizations of the continent of human creation, which has to make it look like she's on her deathbed and ready for cremation. But we must show the world that our mother Africa is strong, vibrant, and defiant because the pulse of nearly a billion people can never die once we take control of what the world sees. And so we can never comply with pictures painted by pessimists on TV of our homeland because we, you and me, we are the pulse of Mother Africa and we must now show the world how proudly we will stand. Thank you. So that is the uh, first piece I wanted to share with you all and it's entitled um, Pulse of the Motherland um, from, from the book, From the Limbs of My Poetry. And it, it represents the first part of the free model that we're talking about today. And that is filter. Any of us who are engaged in teaching anything relating to Africa, whether we're talking K to 14, whether we're talking university level, whether we're talking in professional experiences, we have to make sure that before we even get to the classroom, that we are working together as educators, leaders, wherever our positions are, to really make sure that we're filtering our thoughts about what the continent entails. What's there? What are the images? Where did where and where did we get those images from? Now, as you could tell from my name, I was born in a faraway place called Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, shout out to all my Boston people there. Yes, I see Jennifer. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah, Lloyd, get it. Yeah, Roberta, my peoples. Sorry, those Celtics. <clears throat> oh, that was sorry, Vanessa. That wasn't part of the presentation, but I can always get some Celtic love in there. But growing up in Boston, public school student, growing up in the hood. As you can hear, I don't have what we call a stereotypical African accent, but just by hearing my name, I was subject to incredible, and my siblings, we were subject to incredible levels of abuse, verbally and physically. And some of that verbal abuse came from my teachers. Some will say, oh, you think just because you got that name, I'm supposed to bow down to you, um, you're not a king here, or then you've got the flip side, likening us to animals and the like. So you may come in as, you know, all of us here, we are Africanists in some way, shape or form. We're interested in the continent, we're from the continent, we love teaching about it, but your colleagues may not be. So it's very important that you spend time filtering all of the knowledge that they have about the African continent. And just using that term continent, we all know, is powerful enough because most people still, as I said in the poem, view the continent as a country. I'm going to travel to Brazil. I'm going to South Korea. I'm going to Jamaica. I'm going to Africa. We know that that is still the case. And so my philosophy has always been, even when I was, I teach at the university level now, but even when I was teaching from kindergarten to 12th grade, uh, from those experiences in Boston and as well as in uh, parts of Maryland as well, 
my whole point was we have to get on the same page because if you start at the wrong departure point, you're gonna end up at the wrong destination. And then you bring parents into the mix who got their own thoughts about how the African continent is, is, is and what it's supposed to be. You know, People don't wanna have conversations about how we've had female presidents before the United States, for example, and, and, and all of the beauty that is there. There's so much of the negative because when you look at television, the, the U.S., I'm only speaking the U.S. Well, I've been in other 30 countries, but I'm talking U.S. right now. You know, the media can only handle like one African conflict per decade, right? So that's all you're going to get. So in like the 2000s, Heidi, you know, you got what, uh, Rwanda. Then in, uh, no, in the 90s, you know, it was Rwanda. First decade of 2000s, it was Sudan. Then, you know, the last decades, all of us have been trying to fight for attention. You got a little bit of Congo sprinkled here. You got a little bit, you know, but that's all they got. That's all they got room for. We have to do the work to go deeper. So the first poem is about filtering. And you all here have to be the leaders in that movement. You can't expect anyone else to do it in your educational communities, but you. So like it or not, that's your responsibility. I wanna move on to my next word. My next word is release. And it's kind of like release and review, but let's just stick with release for now. This poem is entitled The African, The American. How you doing, Octavia? Good, what's up, what's up James? <clears throat> Some people desire to inquire what my name means because it sounds so powerful. Ome Congo, like I need to play some drums when I say it. Others ask me if it's my birth name as if it's any of, my, of their business. But short of the intrinsic inclination to input inhabitants into predetermined non-pensive packages, few people ever ask me what it's like to actually be an African in America and an American in Africa. Because for real, I feel like I need to relocate to the center of the Atlantic Ocean because I am truly caught in the middle. The African, the American. I'm remixing Angie Palmer's words from I've been rich and I've been poor to I've been dissed and I've been torn. Because I've been torn between being called the American nigger and the African bush boogie. I'm torn between having to speak African to prove that I'm African in America and speaking French to prove that I'm African in Francophone African countries. What? I'm torn between dealing with the gangs and the tribes, both practicing ethnic cleansing. I'm torn between dealing with one set of my belabored brothers dying for hot diamonds and my other beleaguered brothers living to be iced out, but it still doesn't even out. I'm tormenting watching traffic African sex slaves having hymens torn and American child porn. I'm tormenting dealing with the child soldier and the child gangbanger on the corner. I'm tormenting dealing with African military leaders telling our kids they don't need school to rule and American hip hop artists telling our kids they don't need school to be rich or cool. I'm tormenting dealing with corporations using both my communities as a toxic ditch. I'm torn between I'm a Butu Sese Seiko and I'm Rick James, sis. And I don't know whether to laugh or cry, sis, because as proud as I am to be who I am, I sometimes feel like I have an identity crisis. Now I know why I'm so fond of Transformer cartoons, because the way that people always want me to change up, I feel like I might as well transform my name from Ome Congo to Optimus Dabinga until people realize that in getting past my name and frame, there's much more than meets the eye. But whether I be the American countryman or the transcontinental African, I know that both identities end and I can. So I know that I can be, be me. Let my words do the talking and my actions do the walking because I will never fit into your box, whether I got a fade or some locks. So the next time we're trying to figure out who I am and which stereotypical category I cover, I'll be covered in content if you just called me that brother. Yes. So that uh, poem is called The African, uh, The American. Uh, thank you, Octavia. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, and this deals with our conversation about releasing, right? When we talk about building a diasporic mindset based in unity, the question has to have, we have to ask is, what preconceived notions do you have of the other group? Before you even see what I talked about with the first poem, that's the colleagues and people y'all work with. But now we got to talk about you because even with all of our education, even with all of our degrees, we have to do some intense work on our own to challenge our own stereotypes and biases. Because as somebody whose parents are Congolese, but I was born in the States, 
in my travels across the continent, there was a lot of conversation about, oh, you're not African. You're because you weren't born here. Or you don't speak this. You don't speak that. You don't belong. Then I come back to the States and I got people saying, oh, can you speak African? For real? Like they know nothing about Swahili and, you know, or, 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 or Pula or um, anything, right? Because of the biases. And so what are your thoughts? What are the conversations that you have as it relates to African identity? One of the videos I'm going to be posting up on my YouTube channel, and I'm not asking y'all to have this conversation now, um, but I've come to the conclusion that, well, not really a conclusion. I've always believed this. I don't believe that African-Americans can appropriate African culture. See, I teach a class at American called Appropriation or Appreciation, and we go deep into, or it's called the Kim Kardashian class. You can pick a title. I mean, so it's like, how can you talk appropriation and not talk about the Kardashians? I'm just saying. But can't even keep up with them. The show got canceled. But, you know, so it's just like, yo, when we have these conversations, because my belief is that if, if, if your source is the continent in terms of your ancestry, you can't appropriate what was already yours. Now, people can misinterpret, they can disrespect it and mock it and all of that, but we have these conversations that, oh, if you're from the West Indies, if you were born in Europe, or if you were born in the States, like your roots cannot be African and therefore you're separate. And so some of us grow up and become educators with that mentality. And some of us become scholars and still have that same mentality where we're looking down on different groups who are part of the same diaspora. And that has been my, my experience on many levels. We have to do a deeper dive. This whole conversation about who's a real African or who's not an African anymore, that's divisive. And we gotta realize that you know we're coming from the same source, but we just got dropped off on different parts of the boat on the way here or to wherever we are right now. And then we can have a conversation when I'll get into the last poem where we talk a little bit about the Afro-Asian community and the like. And so it's very important that we go into this idea of releasing these preconceived notions about different groups, especially if we've never engaged in real conversations about them or with them. My first trip to an African country was Senegal during study abroad. And just a number of stereotypes that existed with Af about, about African-Americans. Look, when I walked into a, tele a house, the first music video I saw was Biggie Smalls hypnotized. And then I was a Georgetown University student, Rosina, right? And I'm watching the game and people were like, yo, I wanna go to Georgetown. Everybody at Georgetown, Roger is black. I'm like, what? They're like, look at the team. I'm like, uh, no, like I'm the other black person. Like I was there like yesterday. So it's like, what are you talking about? But what you have to understand is almost going back to the first poem that the media that's brainwashing us here is brainwashing people across the world as well. When we talk about Clear Channel, all of these places, Rachel, all of these, we got to understand that. See, there's a reason why we won't see empowering shows about Africa as a continent in the United States. But you also got to understand in places like Senegal, they won't show movies like Roots. Why? Because when the original Roots came out and some people on the continent got to see what actually happened with slavery, 10 white people were killed that night because people were like, we didn't know. There were anger, there were frustration. And so we're getting brainwashed on so many different sides. So we have to do the work individually to work, let go of our own preconceived notions so we can really get deeper in this work. So that's what I mean when I say release. And when I said I meant release and review, I mean, we gotta actually start looking at it ourselves. Uh, if we don't do it, why should we expect anybody else to? And despite all of our education, despite all of our experiences, despite all of our travel, all the books we've written, we know if we're gonna be honest that we have some of these notions or we have had them and we gotta do the work to check them. So I'm moving on to the next word. So I kind of get really animated. So I keep the water close if you don't mind. I'm just saying, I'm like, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna be about this life, Sherry, you gotta like do it. You know what I'm saying? So um, <clears throat> this next, the next term is educate. Let me share the poem and then we'll talk about it. I'll do one more and talk about it and we'll go into questions and answers. Oh uh, yeah. This is about Congo, the world's richest country, now the poorest, a chorus of women's cries across a corrupted country in demise. 
International lies hide the truth of our turmoil, raping our country of our women, tungsten, Colton, and gold. Young girls now a commodity. It's no longer an oddity. Child soldiers watching bullets and not birds fly over their sky so that we can sit pretty with our PlayStations, laptops, and iPhones. I roam alone across Africa's first world war, starving a country, but feeding the globe. Little babies dying so we can have a cell phone and warm home, an Xbox, a TV, a computer, a flat screen, flatlining the dreams of millions of Congolese, never quite able to control their destiny. Mineral gifts turn to curses, body bags with no hearses, babies bouncing from the womb to the tomb in a matter of minutes. But in a minute, you can decide to help turn this tide. Raise your voice for the people. Raise hope for the Congo. Turn your cell phone into a microphone and speak knowledge to your college. Tell these computer companies we need conflict-free products. Realize that you're a fool if you don't check the trail of those jewels. You see diamonds and gold be the fuel to this fire. How can gold become a cancer? I'm searching for an answer in a land where diamonds are not a girl's best friend. But together, working with the Congolese, we can change this direction. If we all decide to raise our conscience and each one teach one, reach one in our grasp and create an army of change, an army of soldiers committed to real action and not communal, communal social and religious prostitution for political prosecution. The true resolution is empowering our women. The center of our land must be made whole once again. The backbone of our nation must be realigned. When our women can stand proudly, our country will once again have its spine. The pride of our future lies in our young boys. The heart of our future lies in our young girls. Congo's future is in all of our hands if we just understand that we're all in this together. So let's all raise hope and take a stand for our land. Now, uh, that poem was called Raising Hope. Uh, it was from an album I did with... Um, uh, a bunch of artists came together and we are, did this album to raise awareness about what's taking place in the Congo. So it was my shell, myself, um, Cheryl Crow was involved, uh, Most Deaf for Yasin Bey, um, Angelique Kijo, Nora Jones, Damian Rice, Michelle Degio Cello, a bunch of us, whatever. Um, I can't remember all of the names, but uh, we are raising awareness about what's taking place on, on, on the continent right now. Um, and the reason why I say educate is because too many times when we talk about the African continent, we primarily talk about it in referencing slavery, or we may talk about ancient African history, pre-slavery. A lot of people don't go that far, but that's really important. But my point in sharing that poem is that there's a lot of ways you can make Africa relevant in the classroom right now. What is the hottest selling item on the market right now, Luke? Any idea? Anybody? Anybody? Come on. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it in the chat. PlayStation 5. Thank you, Jessica. They beat you to it, Luke. They beat you to it. Yo, the, return, the minerals in that make the PlayStation 5 run come from Congo. So that's a science lesson. That's a geology lesson. Everything, every class that you teach, everything that you are engaged in can relate to Africa in some way, shape or form. You teach women's studies, we can talk about women's rights. You teach about science, we can talk engineering, we can talk about that. You teach about uh, water rights and you, you could talk about that. You, you wanna talk about tech and some of the things that kids are doing with tech in places like Liberia and the like, you can talk about that. You can talk about how the United States does a great job of exporting prisons more than it does democracy. And how some of these, for those of y'all teach upper level courses and how some of these guys who run private prisons are going to African countries talking about, oh, you wanna know how to build prisons? We can show you how to do it. I spoke in prisons when I was in South Africa. My point is that we have to educate ourselves, Alice, I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? You know, we gotta educate ourselves on Africa beyond the stereotypes of what our educational leaders or superintendents or whatever will allow us to teach. There's so much innovation taking in place on the continent. All of us are using materials that come from the Congo right now in this, in this presentation. Our cell phones, our computers, anything that has an on switch, the tablets in our, in our cars when we're driving, right? So you can connect Africa now and not just, you know, the Kings and Queens narrative is of course important because most of us, as I said in the first poem, look at Africa as a place of savagery, we get that. But if you can also make it relevant today, I teach also, I teach another course called Global Hip Hop and Resistance. 
You know, you can you could talk about the music movements and the collaborations that are happening artistically with artists in, in African countries and, and the United States. People like, I'm gonna say his name, I don't really feel like it after this election, but you know, Lil Wayne and you know, like these guys, I'm you know, who are doing collaborations. Forgive me, Alyssa, I'm just saying. I, I, first guy who came to mind because I talked about him this week. Um, so that's my point. We have to educate ourselves on the deeper connection to the African con to the African globe, uh, of Africa to the globe. There are countries that are doing better democratically right now than the United States. There are countries that are doing better for sure with their COVID response than the United States. Can we talk about that? Rwanda had what, like eight cases? Ghana, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's just like doing that, the modern day stuff, you can do that from every grade level that you're involved in, all right? And I wanted to share that for real. Um, the last poem, so this is what I'm gonna do. I like to end on a high note. So I'm gonna, the last poem is about emancipate, freeing ourselves. So I'm, I'm gonna save that towards the very end. It's actually gonna be the last poem I do and then we're gonna close because we got a quick stop at 1250. So what I want to do oh, uh, right now is, you know, people have some questions in the chat or people want to share. Um, some people have been asking, um, I see about like my work. Um, you can type in my name on iTunes and all of the places where music is sold and get everything that I just shared. Um, there's music that accompanies those. The last poem I'm going to do is called Free Your African Mind, just so you know. Uh, they're also in my books. Uh, somebody put it in there from the limbs of my poetry. Thank you for sharing that. So, you know, Amazon and all of those places as well. Um, you can, you can, they're, they're available where all, where books are sold. So you can order that as well. Um, I don't have a preferred bookstore. Um, I haven't gotten that sophisticated yet. Um, I saw that question. So with that, um, you know, if anyone has any questions or, or, or comments, um, uh, Vanessa, should I hop in the chat? Did you want to pull some? How, how did you want to do it? I'll follow your lead. Oh, Todd, you are so kind. <clears throat> We can go ahead with your poem and then we I can check to see. I, I'll I'll pull them up from the from the chat. Okay, cool. So I'll hop into the poem now. That's cool. We can keep the poetic vibes going, yes. This is my last poem of the day <clears throat> called Free Your African Mind. What's up, Chasey? Lillian, you good? Lena, you good? Y'all are cool people. I I y'all are, you know. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. This is really great. Here we go. <clears throat> free your African mind, my brother. Free your African mind, my sister. Free yourself from those mental chains that say you don't come from the dark continent when ain't no one on the continent darker than you. Realize you've been brainwashed by wicked white men, but your oppression has also been perpetrated by your own brethren. I know that the rapings, castrations, and lynchings were grueling but the castration of the mind has more longevity than a lynching. You're wrenching further and further away from your motherland. You let them tell you that your slave inspired slang was Ebonics and not a rich African language with English words. And so you were afraid to speak the word. You believed them when they told you your continent was dark. However, you didn't realize it's because they've been trying to steal her sunlight for centuries. From whitening the ancient Egyptian to whitening Beethoven to whitening Michael Jackson, you've been brainwashed. From slave codes to black codes to Jim Crow, you've been brainwashed. From K1 to cum laude, you've been brainwashed. You see, you want to be American, though America has decided she no longer needs you, while the entire continent pleads for you to come home. So for your African mind. Free those naps suppressed under that process. Free those hips and those tight jeans that only attract negative attention and suffocate your natural nilotic curves. Free those brown luscious lips from ravishing red lipstick. Brothers, free your kidneys from sipping 40s and sip fresh waters from the Nile Basin. Free yourself from feeling you have to step all over your lady and step with me and my Kilimanjaro. Free your mind and stop trying to free Willie into our co-partner in our fight for liberation. To deny that you're African is to deny your place on earth as the first. Why claim to be a nigger and kill over street corners when you can claim ancient Nubia? Why claim a country when you can have a continent? I speak to all of you in denial from African Americans to West Indians to even continental Africans. Malcolm and Marcus and Marley died trying to free your minds. Accepting your rich African blood turns you into a worldwide majority and not a national minority. 
It stretches your history much farther than Mississippi. It explains why you're as beautiful as you are, why you worship like no other, and why you can never be defeated while standing on the shoulders of God and your ancestors. All of you rise. You ghetto prisoners who are really Ghanaian princes rise. You downtrodden women who are really Burundian princesses rise. You who think being born on the continent is enough to make you African rise. Dark skinned Latinos rise. Confused Cape Verdeans rise. Westernized West Indians rise. Egocentric Euro Africans rise. And Afro-Asians rise, almost annihilated Australian Aborigines rise. Realize, like Bob Marley realized, that being African is a state of mind and walk with me through that bright African sunrise. And I guarantee your mind, body, spirit, and nation will rise, 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 high as the glistening skies. Just free your almighty African mind. Thank you. Questions? Oh, thanks. I'm seeing hand waves and finger snaps and stuff. Well, folks Thank excited you. that you're picking up Cape Verde. <laughs> hey, I got to. Boston and Cape Verde with my peoples all day, all day. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you. Thank you. Some Thank folks you. were asking about your clips. Where can they find the best video clips of you? YouTube. Um, I have my YouTube page. Um, it's just youtube.com slash Congo. Um, you will actually see a live performance of Fear African Mind that I did in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, so that was really uh, powerful uh, there. So youtube.com slash um a lot of live performances. Some of my official music videos on the hip hop side are also there. Um, the African, the American that I shared today, that's also there. And of course, like I said, all of the places where music can be downloaded, you can also get them there as well. And then my website is just omekongo.com. At omekongo.com, I got a lot of stuff there as well. Some things that aren't on YouTube. And for those who like Curse Free Hip Hop, two weeks ago, I just released a rap hip hop album called What Free Our Freedom Sounds Like, completely curse free. You can enjoy it with the kids, use it in class. Uh, my five-year-old son's on there. My 14-year-old did the artwork for the cover and even my 11-year-old daughter produced one of the beats. So people say they want clean hip hop, but they don't support it. So don't talk about it, be about it. <sighs> Questions, anybody? Come on, guys, hit me up. We got nine minutes. <laughs> Someone put up a, uh, your Instagram, I see. Yes, I do Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Those are where you can find me. At Ome Congo um, is the main, and LinkedIn, right? Um, at Ome Congo. I thought I was like the only Ome Congo. Then like all these other guys start popping up. They stole it. Um, but yeah, I'm the only at Ome Congo. You can um, holler at me there. I got a podcast, um, Upstanders podcast. And I do this work. Um, I travel the country, the world. Obviously, we're doing a lot of stuff now virtually. I work with public and private and charter schools on issues relating to teaching kids of diverse background and how our schools can become more culturally competent, um, whether it's teaching Black boys, um, whether it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is what I do. This is what I live and breathe. So if there's any ways I can help you and your institutions, you can always reach me um, as well. My email is just my first name on both sides, omekongo at omekongo.com. So oh, Vanessa, asking, should I be reading these? You can, sure. Uh, there's one by Leah Hood that I think you should address. It says, I'm curious about your decision to start the poem with referencing men. If you could please speak to that. With referencing what? Someone's long mowing. Well, <laughs> sorry, referencing poem with referencing men. I'm not sure which poem she means. Let's see. Leah Hood, could you clarify? Yeah, I don't know. Do you have pieces on work about African LGBTQ pride? I do not yet. I have not done a lot of writing. So more of my writing recently has been more hip hop stuff. And even with that, I haven't incorporated um, that yet, but I plan to, especially this semester. After this semester is over, I'm gonna be doing a lot of writing this summer. Uh, I mean, this winter. See, I, I'm getting the seasons confused, but uh, I will do that. So, and whoever asked that question, if you have information that I should read on stuff, please send it to me. Everything that y'all just heard comes from hours and hours of research. And then I take like an hour to write the poem actually when I'm ready to do it. So, because, you know, we're researchers. That's what we do, right? I mean, I'm saying we're in association. What about your writing process? So my writing process is if I can't write a poem in less than an hour, it doesn't feel right. So I might think about a poem for three years. I might walk around with my phone and jot down a note or two or here and there. But when it feels right is when I sit down and I actually write it. And if I can't knock it out in an hour, I just don't do it. So everything you've heard, 
the, the third poem I did was written in 30 minutes. Uh, so, you know, you just got to feel it. I'm a vibe guy. You just got to feel it. You know what I'm saying, Mickey? You just got to like go for it. So that's how I operate. How and sometimes about... I write poems for companies. They'll give me information and I'll just make a poem for them. Like I've written songs for NASA and different places like that. Do you have any suggestions on how to start conversations with parents about some of these issues that you raised about stereotypes? Um, ask more questions before you start teaching because you don't want to put yourself in a position where your, your audience feels like they're being undermined and disrespected. So if you just walk in thinking that they think all African, all Africa is a country and a savage and monkeys and you start talking like that, they're not going to hear you. So do a survey of some sort and base your conversations based off the survey because you can see where their levels are. I mean, imagine if I didn't know y'all and I just came in talking like y'all didn't know anything about Africa. Y'all wouldn't have lasted five minutes with me. You know, y'all have been like, yo, Brenda, this is that dude you said you saw? You know what I'm saying? But it's like, I know who we are. So I know where I can go. I know where I can take it, right? So you have to know who they are before you want them. It's like Stephen Covey says, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. That's how it's got to work. Here's a great question from Octavia. Uh, a piece of advice for her students in fifth grade who struggle with reading and writing and who see themselves in your words. <clears throat> I So I do like poetry workshops with kids where they can like learn to empower themselves through poetry. But I would say start introducing me music into the classroom. Music has been really powerful in helping kids, you know, get better grades, understand concepts a little bit better. Um, I remember the guy who did the Boondocks TV show. He has a thing called Help, the Hip Hop Education Literacy Project. Um, where he takes science lessons and water and he'll take rap songs like most deaths, New World Water and turn them into lessons about water. You know, like um, help, help hop education literacy project. I forget his name, Asheru, Asheru, A-S-H-E-R-U, Asheru. But start introducing more music, more, more film stuff into it. Start, you have to reach them where they are. That's where I started rapping because I, what, everything I just shared to y'all, each one of those poems could be a three hour talk at, 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 at an event for us. But I had to reach the kids where they were. So that's why I started doing that. So start incorporating more arts into the classroom and I can guarantee you, you'll start getting a better response. So I see we only have three more minutes but maybe we could just access this last question. Um, I'm trying to use anti-racist language in my art says Marie Darling um, in my art curriculum with her middle school students and wants to really incorporate African art and culture in a mindful way. Do you have resources that are like that? Well, I, I would say that quite honestly, nobody has better resources better than, than the ASA and all of the work that you're bringing, the books and stuff that you bring in, Brenda and Vanessa. And so, you know, I can mention a couple of things here and there, but I know that the research that you all have is more recent and it's and, and just better. You know what I'm saying? And so I would just lean on the network. Can we get How one more? The upstander, the upstander question. What about the upstander project? My upstander leadership project? What about, what is it? Is that something that you could uh, suggest to other folks to, uh, to, to access? Is that a resource? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, I, I would love to work with schools on how they can, you know, tailor their curriculum to be uh, upstanders as it relates to the African context, help people broaden their images about Africa. Like I said, we do a lot of deep diversity, equity, and inclusion work, but we can have an Africa specific thing. We can have some art workshops where we get people writing. We can do it virtually. We can do absolutely all of that. Um, I, I love doing this work and I do a with great kids of all grades levels. So I would love to do this, some upstander leadership work. And we can also do some training with your teacher colleagues about how to teach Africa as well. So we can get that in too. And do non-black kids relate to you? I see that question just popping up here. <laughs> I, no, it ain't all black private schools. I'm speaking <laughs> of 12 schools. Trust me on that one. Um, so yeah, all grades, ages, races, groups, um, they, they, they vibe with what we do. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to Shane and Brenda to kind of give you guys um, uh, the, the advice on how to continue on with this workshop. Thank you so much. I'm like, Ongo, this was absolutely electrifying. Thank you. Y'all take care. Thank you. And I'm sorry, you see my whole screen here, but for speed, I'm going to do this. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to give you guys one second uh, to unmute to um, uh, if I can find it here. 
I want to let you unmute yourselves and um, say thank you to Dr. Omekongo Dibinga. And in the meantime, what you'll see on the screen is information about how to go to the next session. So you yeah. can unmute right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Shukran, shukran, shukran. Muchos gracias. Wonderful. Thank you. Good. Um, thank you, everyone. So in between wow. sessions, you're going to be back to this screen, your main screen, and you can, oops, sorry. Let me move Please. There we go. Um, thank you. Uh, in between sessions, you will be able to connect with other participants via this networking and chat button if you want to. And when this room closes, it's going to drop you back into, you're just going to see your desktop again, and you can choose uh, which session you want to go to for the first session. And we'll be starting at 1 p.m., so you have a 10-minute bio break. And that's it. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Are we done? Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. And Dr. Dubinga, I want to thank you again so much. Thank you. It was a thank lot of you. Fun. Appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we ended. Great. Here we go. We awesome. ended and yet we are still here. Okay. I'm going to end this session <laughs> and then okay. we'll see you in the next workshop, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much, Shane. Work Thanks. your magic. <laughs> <laughs> <I love it. laughs>